This is Caps PA announcer Wes Johnson, and you're listening to Bull the Pod. Welcome to the latest episode of What the Puck, a podcast about the 2018 Stanley Cup champion, your Washington Capitals. Thank you for checking out tonight's show, and as you can probably tell by now, my co-host Brandon is unavailable this evening, so I'm going solo. Now, it's getting close to dinner time as I record, so let's jump right into Cap's World, where in the past week they went 1-1-1. One, one, and one. It's not going to be the only team this week going 1-1-1 one, one, one associated with the Washington Capitals, but they had ones across the board, got a win over the Islanders, a bad loss to Vancouver, and they had a comeback overtime win against Winnipeg. Lots to get into with those games. Let's start there. We'll start with the Islanders game where, even though it was a 2 nothing win, they got the empty netter, so it was closer than you might think. The Islanders are struggling this season, so you'd like to see them get a little bit better, but or a little bit better of a win, I should say. But as we've seen with this team as of late, they don't exactly do what you're expecting them to do. They're going through a bit of a slump. Looks like they might be turning things around a little bit, especially after the first five to ten minutes in that game against Winnipeg. But uh, you'd like to think they get a better win against the Islanders. Vanacek, though, comes out with a shutout, which is nice to see considering the goalie situation. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But with the Islanders struggling this season, I mean, they're 13, 13, and 6, 32 points. They are in last in the Metropolitan Division. It doesn't look like they're going to be making much of a, a headway going forward. Doesn't think they're going to be making the playoffs this year. And that could be attributed to a lot of different things for them. But this isn't a podcast about them. But either way, that game against the Islanders, I'll take the two points. Probably should have been better. And then you have that game, and then the just embarrassing loss to Vancouver, which just looks like the Caps didn't care. Samsonov probably should have had a better game. But then again, so should the rest of the team. I know Vancouver's a better team than they have been of late. They're climbing out of, I believe they were in eighth place at one point in the Pacific. They are now up to sixth with 39 points, so three back of Calgary, five back of San Jose. So they're trying to make a run to the playoffs. They've been doing well under Boudreaux, even though they were, I think, on a three-game losing streak. But the Caps just look, I don't want to say disinterested, but they certainly had a lack of interest in winning that game. And I know you're going to have ups and downs. And teams go, we talk all the time on this show about how teams go through peaks and valleys. And it is what it is sometimes. But you'd like to see that they have a, a more solid effort, a better effort against a team like Vancouver. It's not like it used to be in the past where you don't really know what you're going to get from these teams that are in the Western conference that you just don't see as often. You have plenty of opportunities to watch a video, to watch their games, to see what's going on. And they should have had a better effort overall against the Canucks. And like I said, this is not the Canucks of earlier in the season, but the Capitals have the players to be able to come out, and get a better effort. You know, if you're going to lose, at least lose trying. Don't just lose by being there because that's not good enough for a team that not only has, not only wants to make the playoffs, but has aspirations of doing something in the playoffs and making a run while you still have this, these generational talent players in Alex Ovechkin and Nick Backstrom. You have Carlson, you know, uh, for a bit longer in his career. He's only, how old is Carlson at this point? He is only, I can't find him on this list, 32. So he's still got a few good years left in his career, potentially more than that. Defensemen sometimes can play until they're much older. You have TJ Oshie. I'm not sure how much time he's, how much timer, how much time he's got left in his career. Probably about the same amount as Ovechkin and Backstrom. I would imagine he's 35, but he's got some injury issues. We'll talk about that in a few minutes in terms of what that might mean for the Capitals as we get closer and closer to the trade deadline. When is the trade deadline? Let's look that up real quick as we talk about that because that is going to be a big part of how far into the playoffs this team can go. Trade deadline is on the 11th. That can't – oh, you know what? I wrote 2002, not 2022. That makes more sense. The actual trade deadline is on March 21st. Why did I think it was in February? All right, they have more time than I thought. So either way, still interesting things to talk about when it comes to the deadline, but like I said, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. The Winnipeg game was the most recent one. And I feel like the first five to six minutes when Winnipeg went up to nothing, it was probably even less. It was like first four minutes. I feel like that was a perfect representation. Like those four minutes was a perfect representation of this Capitals team over the past, let's say two to three weeks of just, just poor hockey at the wrong time. 
giving up goals they probably shouldn't have. And I'm not blaming the goalie for that necessarily. I, I'm blaming the overall team for that because they just came out with this effort where they were not matching what Winnipeg was bringing physically, uh, uh, speed, any aspects. They just weren't bringing it. And, but you do have to give them credit that they were able to come back and get an overtime win. Their first overtime win in, regu- uh, in regulation. That doesn't make any sense. Their first overtime win this season. And I think they were 0 and 7, and they were 2 and 2 in the shootout. So 1 and 7 in overtime. Not great. Not only should you have less overtime games, but you should probably try and win more of them. But I'll take it that they finally took them until January, but they were finally able to pull that off. But I think with that game, what it shows is that this team is not necessarily going to sit back. And I think that effort, whether you go down early, and it's very easy for a team to be like, well, woe is us, or to allow more goals to happen. And Winnipeg was certainly bringing it the rest of that game. I think that that showed that this team can produce. But I wonder how much these three games and the issues they had in each one of these games from what should have been probably an easier win against the Islanders, what should have been a closer game or a win against Vancouver, and what should have been a better start and a better uh, not effort in terms of not having to give up the late goal to go into overtime against Winnipeg comes down to just injuries. Can't do anything about players contracting the virus or being part of COVID protocol because they were close contacts or whatever the case would be, because I think, I don't know what the rules are in regards to the NHL in terms of if you're vaccinated and how that's going to play a part um, in terms of if you're close contact, whether you're allowed to be around the other guys or not play, whatever the case may be, not the point. They can't do anything about all the players that are going in and out of COVID, but they can do something about players to an extent that are getting injured. TJ Oshi can't stay in the lineup this season. Of their, how many games do the Caps play at this point? 40 games? Oshie has played in 18. Which he's still pretty high up on the team in terms of scoring. Which is fairly impressive considering he's only played in 18 games. Which shows how much they need his production. But you're not getting it this season. For one reason or another. Between COVID stuff. Between injuries. And that just happens. Sometimes players have a season where they just can't stay healthy. And it happens, you know, potentially more often when you're older. And like I said before, he's 35 years old. So you can't necessarily rely on Oshi this season. That's not a slight against him as a person or the player. It's the reality of the situation. 18 games out of 40 is not great. It's less than half. And, you know, that's just how math works. At one point, I think Brandon said this last week, but this team has been without Anthony Mantha for, he's missed, what, the last 30 games? I think it is. At one point, I actually forgot he was on the roster, which is messed up. But it's, it's, it is what it is. Mantha hasn't played, what, like at all this season? And we're not, we're not sure if he's going to be coming back. I would imagine that they're going to be doing the same things that they were doing with Backstrom. That's what it seems like. That's what I think uh, Tarek El-Bashir had put out in a, uh, a piece on The Athletic where he a mailbag, something like that. I don't remember exactly if they call it mailbag or something else on The Athletic. But it was a he was taking questions, and one person asked about Mantha, and I went, "Oh yeah, he's on the roster. He's on the team in the organization. Is he coming back? Because that's something that uh, that's someone that could definitely jump into your top six. Because you need that offensive production. You can't only rely on Ovechkin and Kuznetsov and Wilson to an extent. But look at here are these numbers in terms of top four point getters for the Capitals right now. You have Ovechkin with fifty five. Then you drop by sixteen points to Kuznetsov." Then you drop by an additional 11 to Tom Wilson. He's got 28. Then you drop to Connor Sheary at 19 points. This team needs help offensively. And when you're missing Oshi and you're missing Mantha, and it looks like they may not be able to play more, you're going to have to go out and make some moves and bring someone in. The problem they run into is, one, you might get Oshi back and actually able to stick around for a while. And you, you hopefully can get Mantha back before the end of the season. And the issue with that is they both have very large cap hits. And how do you fit other players onto your roster that are going to produce? Because if you're bringing in someone for the top six, they likely have a pretty decent cap hit. How do you bring these guys in and fit them in under your salary cap? 
Now, the easy answer is that you trade someone away in a deal to bring in someone as potentially a throwaway or um, as part of a separate deal. But you move someone out that's going to cost you a lot of money. And I think right now the easy person to target is Carl Hagelin. And it's not because he scored and ruined Zach Fucali's shutout streak, which is an interesting note on his NHL record so far. But Hagelin currently, he's got this year and next year on his contract, which I actually think it make him harder to trade him. He's got $2.75 million, which is not a huge sum. He's 3.4% of the cap's overall uh, uh, salary cap, or, or uh, salary within the salary cap right now. So it's not a huge amount, but that 2.75 can help by moving that out. It's that's actually less than that because the cap gets my understanding. If I and this could be 100 percent wrong, but it it counts less and less as you go in through the season, especially if you trade him, because the salary cap is actually based on how much they're earning the rest of the season. That could be 100 percent incorrect. What I just said, and if that's the case, my bad. But either way, it's not a huge. I don't think he would be a hard person to move based on his salary. It doesn't help that he's got a contract next season because of his production this year has been pretty so far, offensively. Solid on the PK. Solid checking player. I like having Carl Hagelin on this team. I just You need more production from him. When you have your, your top six or your top offensive forwards that are not producing, you need help from guys that are on the third line, guys that are on the fourth line. You're getting that to an extent from Lars Eller. He's, got eight, he's doing better than he was before. 18 points in 33 games. Hathaway's got 14 in 35 and a beautiful pass to Ovechkin in that Winnipeg game where he's playing on the first line. Forget top line Tom. You're getting, I don't, first line Garnet. That doesn't work. Moving on. But can we get, Daniel Sprong's got 11 and 34. Could we get more production from him? McMichael's got 11 and 37. Could we get more production from him? Can we give him some more minutes to get that production? That'd be nice. Protus is doing pretty good. Nine and 28, but he's a young guy. And he's still finding his way in the NHL, but he's getting more and more comfortable. It sounds like Laviolette really likes what we see from him. I don't think he's a like-for-like like replacement for Haglin, but I think he's filling in nicely with Mantha being out, with Oshie filling out as a young guy, getting more experience, getting more minutes. It's a good thing for him for the future of this organization, but going into the playoffs, you want more, not necessarily veterans, but guys who have been there before, right? I don't know if you call a first year, second year player, even if they've been to the playoffs both those years, I don't know if you necessarily call them a veteran, but you want them with the experience of being in a stress induced, high anxiety, high energy situation, lots of focus that is the playoffs. Which is why at the deadline, I think there's two things that the Caps need to focus on. Maybe three. First, and these are not in any particular order, it's just based on what I'm seeing on my notes I've written here. First, do you find a replacement for Carl Hagelin and get out from under that cap it? And maybe you move him out and you bring up someone like a, and I don't think it's going to be the case, but like a Jan Sifialbi or Brett Leeson, someone that can fill in what and do what he's been doing. Or do you go with an Alexi Protus when, say, everybody's back or you've acquired this top six forward? Is Protus taking Hagelin's spot on the third line or even the fourth line as a big guy who occasionally can put the puck in the net that can play physical? Maybe he can take his place and do what he does on the PK. We don't know. We have to wait and see if that if that was to happen, you know, it's, it's a gamble. But that's what sports is. When you take these chances, when you bring in these players, when you make these decisions, you're gambling. You're hoping for the best and hopefully having an opportunity or a plan to prepare for the worst. Second thing they need to do is they need to find a, a top six winger. You can't – he's a generational talent. One of the best goal scorers in NHL history, in hockey history, and potentially – will be uh, have the record over the next few years with the most goals in NHL history. But you can't always rely on Ovechkin. Kuznetsov's woken up this season, but that's just two guys. Wilson's doing okay. I'd like to see him be almost a, a point-per-game player. He's close. He's eight points away from that. Well, he's not quite there yet. They got a nice little line right now. They're talking about this on uh, Caps this morning, John Walton was, with... Protus, I think it was Protus being with Backstrom and Wilson, and they've done really well together. So I wouldn't anticipate that being broken up necessarily anytime soon. But I think a top six winger is something they have to bring in because you can't necessarily rely. I know Oshie technically, if everybody's healthy, is likely on the third line. 
but you can't necessarily rely on him being there for you throughout the playoffs. And we see what happens with this team when they don't has don't have him scoring goals. And I think they need to go out and they need to trade for a winger. I don't think they're willing to break the bank or, or trade a bunch of assets to be able to bring someone in unless unless a player say mid to late ish twenties, like a 27, 28 would be the latest I'd probably go. But if they're bringing in a 30, 31, 32 year old, I'm not willing to give up a lot because at some point in the next five to six years, potentially less, they're going to be past the Alex Ovechkin era. They're going to be past Nick's ba- Nick Baxter. You're going to be past TJ Oshie. And you need to continue to acquire assets to rebuild a retool. I don't think it's going to be a rebuild, but a retool this team around your next, not star, because I don't think they're going to have another guy ever in this league like Alex Ovechkin. I mean, from the goal scoring to the flair to everything that he brings to the NHL. But you can still have some very good players. Connor McMichael could become a very good player in the NHL. Hendrix Lapierre become a very good player in the NHL. You could have a bunch of great core guys and then you go out and you trade or free agency or maybe you go and you find a stud that just no one else saw or for some reason was a lower drafted guy that you actually brought up and he you know becomes this diamond in the rough kind of thing. But for now, because I don't think they want to get rid of those assets, and I believe Tarek Elbashir brought this up as well, uh, if I mentioned before, part of the athletic I think for now, they're not willing to give up high draft picks and their top-level prospects. You're not going to see McMichael get traded. You're not going to see LaPierre get traded. I'd be shocked. This is not the Philip Forsberg trade. That would be a huge mess. But I could see them moving out a third-round pick or a lower-level prospect. I think Tarek brought up like Alex Alexiev or Lucas Johansson. Johansson? I think Johansson. Moving out one of those guys... And I'd hate to lose Alexiev at this point, but we'll see what happens. They have a pretty good depth in terms of a defense, and that's going to be tested pretty soon with both Carlson. Uh, Carlson's out. We're going to talk about Orlov in a minute. Could you move one of those guys out and bring in a rental that maybe you want to sign after the season? Do you bring in that 30, 31, 32-year-old to help you these in this playoffs? And if it goes well, you keep him around. Because I don't think that's necessarily the end of the world depending on their cap hit. You still got Mantha. I can't even find him on cap friendly. Where is he? There he is. You've got Mantha for 5.7 for two more years after this season. So, and he's only 27. So you still got an opportunity for him to produce. I mean, he's been here for what? A while now, but not really in terms of games played. You've got Oshi for a couple more years. You've got Wilson for two more. If you have to resign him, he's probably going to get a, a nice little raise. There's opportunities after next season to start to retool this team around some of your younger guys. But if if you still want to make that push, trading assets that aren't going to get you your your 24, your 25, your 26 year old star or potential star goal scorer, do you go out and you acquire someone that's really in the prime of their career that can help push you for this? the rest of this season and into the play, ideally into the playoffs, given the caps are currently sitting at where do they have them third in the Metro division, but they have played a couple more games at a bunch of other teams. They're one point behind the Rangers in Carolina who are technically tied for first, both of them with 54 points caps at 53 Carolina's played four less games and Pittsburgh's only two points behind and they've played two less games. So the caps could very easily, once they're all caught up in terms of games played, they could very easily find themselves in fourth place in the Metro, which means we're seeing Carolina in the first round. That's not ideal. There's a significant drop between fourth and fifth place. Columbus is currently in fifth, but they're at 35 points. So there's, you know, there's a huge gap. Was that 16 points between fourth and fifth? And I forget who was on Twitter. I apologize to whoever this person was. I'm probably not listening because they're a much more famous person. Uh, a well-known person in the hockey community, but they were talking about how the playoffs for some extent, at least you can see kind of around the league, those teams are, are are fairly set for a number of, maybe not all of them, but a couple of, two, at least two of the divisions, are pretty set. You have a couple of teams that might be fighting their way in, and a lot can change between between now and the end of the regular season, but at least in the, in the Metropolitan Division, I feel like it's pretty set, unless someone tanks, not the Caps, knock on wood, 
and one of Columbus, Philly, New Jersey, or the Islanders make a huge run, they're more or less set at this point. So, that was number two. Find a top six winger. Who? I have no idea. But I'm curious, and I'll I'll be excited to see that happen. If they don't, I think it's a huge mistake. But again, I'm not willing to give up the future for today. Because to be honest, I... Based on how they're playing right now, I don't think this team makes a long run to the playoffs. They're going to have to improve in a lot of areas. And one of the big areas that they need to improve, and that's the third thing they need to do before at the trade deadline, is bring in a veteran goalie. Samsonov, Vanacek, Fukali, those are the three guys right now. As to who's one and two and three, I'll let you you know argue about that. Everybody's going to have an opinion on it. But none of them are their number one. You go into the playoffs with these three guys, you're not getting out of the first round. None of them have shown any consistency at the NHL level. Fukali hasn't played long enough to show consistency. He's a great story. But right now, based on his performance, I don't see him as anything more than potentially a backup in the NHL. But part of that is because we just don't have enough to see. I'm likely 100% wrong. But you need to see more of him at the NHL level to say, yeah, this is what he is. Right now, it's just potential or possibility. And we've seen players in the past, goalies, forwards, defense, whatever, that come up, you know, they they are able to really come into their own and become an NHL player in some way later in their career. And later in their career, he's what, like 26? Where's Fukali on this list? I mean, he's not he's not that old. He's not like it's a guy where you're like, well, yeah, he's 26. So it's not like he's, you know, he's not a 35-year-old. He has every opportunity to start playing in the NHL be as a starter or a backup. But I don't think he's a, he's a guy that you want necessarily having the opportunity to get out in there in the ice in the playoffs. I don't think you can ask that. I don't think you can ask that of him right now. I don't think it's fair. But between Sam Sonoff and Vanacek, their top two goalies, neither one of them have taken this job and run with it. Hell, they haven't taken this job and walked with it. Well, maybe walk. Light jog. There have been spots. There have been signs where you go, all right, I actually might have something here. But then they go back to showing that they don't have the experience, they don't have the consistency, and that's what this team needs. It needs the consistency. And that's why I think they need to go out and acquire a goalie. And I keep bringing him up, but Tarek, I think, was answering this question during his mailbag as well, where he was talking about this team needs to go out and acquire a goalie. And who that is, whether it's a bring it back, and it'd be a great story. I don't know if it's the best idea. And I don't know if it's going to happen because Dallas is currently, where are they? They're, you know, they're fighting for a playoff spot. They're out of it right now. They're eight points. Nope, that's not how math works. Nine points behind Minnesota. But there's still plenty of hockey left to play. So they have every opportunity to get into the playoffs. They're going to make a push. I know people keep talking about Jonathan Quick. LA is currently in second in the Pacific. I don't see that happening. I don't know why a team that's only three points behind Vegas for top in the Pacific would trade away their their top goalie or their number two because they have I think it's Campbell. I don't see that happening. But someone like a Holpe, I know Mark Andre Fleury would be brought up, and that would just be weird. I don't I don't necessarily like that idea from the aspect of it would just be really freaking weird to have Mark Andre Fleury on the Capitals. They, there's too much history there. It can happen. By all means, his stats aren't great this season, but he's playing for a Chicago team that doesn't have great stats this season. So that's certainly part of it. And he's shown that he can play in the NHL. He's a free agent after the season, so he's a rental. It doesn't hurt you in that regard. It's an interesting option, but it would be so strange to see. And there are a couple of other uh, goalies out there that were part of the article from Tarko. If you have the, uh, um, the Athletic, go ahead and check it out. Usually they have some sort of deal going on every once in a while where you can get it for cheaper. But I think going out and acquiring a goalie should be their top priority. Because even without the goal scoring, you need a very good goalie to sometimes steal you games in the playoffs. I mean, look at what Hopi did in the cup run. Yeah, he didn't play the first two games because Grubauer was playing better as we got towards the end of the regular season, at the end of the regular season. But Hopi stole games for them to an extent, or kept them in games. Let's not say stole games. He kept them in games throughout that playoff run. And that's what you need. You need a goalie that's going to be on top of their game throughout the playoffs. 
And I don't see that that's going to be possible from Samsonov. I don't think that's going to be possible for Vanacek. So I think they need to go out and they need to acquire someone. And whether it's a rental or someone who's here in next year, the problem with bringing in someone who's going to have a contract for next year is that it's likely going to come with a higher cap hit because they're an older goalie. And at that point, I don't know if this team's going to have the cap flexibility to pull that off without having to make a couple extra moves. And let me go back to the caps on Cap Friendly, which is a great website, capfriendly.com, to look at salary cap and kind of all, all that sort of interestingness. But they have a lot of guys signed up for next season. They're either going to re-sign or replace Justin Schultz. His $4 million is coming off the books, but if you want to bring him back, you'd probably be right around the same, if not higher. Matt Irwin's a free agent. Not the end of the world. Both of your, I just realized this, both of the goalies are free agents restricted, but free agents after the season, that's interesting. So Schultz is your big one, but you also need to re-sign Brett Leeson. That's probably going to happen. Pretty easy. You got to make a decision about Daniel Sprong. But everybody else is signed up for next season. Ovechkin, Baxter, Kuznetsov, Oshie, Wilson, Eller. I feel like those guys are all untouchable. They're not going anywhere. Hathaway, he's only 1.5. You're probably not... You're not going to get a lot in a trade for him, and I think he brings a lot to the roster right now that you don't want to move him out. McMichael's not going anywhere. He's still got two years left on his deal. You're not losing Scarbosa. He's minor league for the most part, but he's nice to have. Protus, Dowd's not going anywhere. He's got a new deal. $1.3 million, not a huge cap hit. I like that deal. I was surprised by it, but I like it. But this is still going to be, as of right now, this is still a very veteran team going into next season, at least offensively. You got Orlov, Carlson, uh, Jensen, Van Dreamsdijk, Favari. All of them have contracts next season. So there's not a lot of holes in this roster to fill next year. So if you bring in a goalie that has a high cap hit, that's taking away an opportunity for someone else. Uh, not an opportunity, but a spot for someone else and a spot you might need. I also am curious as to whether, and I don't know if they would do this, but is that they would include Samsonov for Vanacek in a trade. And maybe we'll be shocked that they'll go out and they'll find a team and they'll acquire a goalie that's in his their mid to late 20s. That becomes the number one. That could happen. I don't know who. But those are the three things that I want to see going into the deadline. I need to see a goalie. I need to see a winger. And I need to see them do something with Hagelin. And maybe they do nothing with Haglin and do something in the offseason. But if they want the cap space, they want some flexibility, I think he's the first guy you look at going, sorry, Carl, but you are going to be a salary cap casualty. We need to get you out of here. Now, I talked about the defense a few moments ago and talking about how Carlson's out. Well, the caps are going to be without Dmitry Orlov as the NHL Department of Player Safety announced that they have suspended him for two games for his knee-on-knee hit of Ellers from Winnipeg in the game the other night. First, I'm curious as to how they decide how many games. Like, is there a chart? I'd love to see if there's a chart where they go, okay, this is the, like, what things need to be part of the situation for them to decide it's one, two, three, however many games. I, I'm curious. And I'd be, I have to give the NHL credit with these Department of Player Safety videos and things they put out. I actually think it's not always agreed upon in terms of what the decision is. But I, I applaud them for at least putting the information out there. In regards to this, this specific situation, I, I had a hard time with this one in terms of deciding like how to, to you know, quote unquote, feel about it. When I saw earlier today when Samantha Pell of the Washington Post had, had put out that uh, he was getting a hearing, that Orlov, you know, I figured he's probably going to get in some trouble. I don't think he's just going to get a stern talking to. Two games, I don't know. It seems a little dramatic. I think Ellers, he doesn't really put himself in a good position. He's bringing, he's got the puck. He's moving the puck around the boards. He kind of, he not kind of, he leaves his leg out, but he's on ice. You can't just stop necessarily. Like you have to put a leg out to stop. He puts himself in kind of a bad spot, but I do think that the responsibility is Orlov to not go knee on knee. Orlov does turn his leg out, but I think he's kind of going for the puck. Problem is, he's nowhere near the puck when he tries to stop the pass. Like, Orlov's just late on that one. Not even close, and that's probably where it should have ended. That he went for the puck, he missed. It kind of seems like Orlov's trying to do something to slow Ellers down or stop him, because at that point, if he goes, say Orlov avoids a hit entirely, goes to the ports, 
goes to turn around and go back to, to, to mark him. Others going to the goal and there's no one else near him. He's probably getting a good shot on net. Potentially a goal. You know, we're not going to, we'll never know if that was going to happen. But Orlov could have avoided the hit. Or, instead of going necessarily for the puck because he was nowhere freaking close to it, he could have just gone for the body on body contact. Even if you don't get body on body, <coughs> excuse me, you could at least, you know, stick an arm out, kind of push him, knock him off balance, slow him down somehow. That's not going to necessarily get you in trouble. But enough that gives you an opportunity to kind of slow him down, which gives you a chance to turn, spin, bounce off the boards, and continue to mark him at, uh, in front of the goal. Orlov earned the suspension by just making a poor play. And he made it worse. The one major aspect that I don't necessarily like about this, the, the video itself specifically, what they said, the, the NHL Department of Player Safety, is that they mention that Ellers is injured, gets injured on the play. And I don't think that should matter. And the reason I say that is that, one, all of our bodies are different. One player gets hit one way, another player gets hit the exact same way, one guy could get injured, one guy can't. Depends where you're at on the ice. It depends, you know, how far are you away from the boards? Could you have a head injury, neck injury, shoulder injury based on how you're hit and how far you're away from the boards? If a guy gets hit, you know, chest to, to uh, sorry, shoulder to chest in the middle of the ice, they hit the, you know, they get knocked down wherever the case may be. That's going to be different than if he gets hit a couple feet away from the boards and his head goes awkwardly into it. Does the player have a prior injury that's more likely to be uh, hurt again as a result of a hit than someone who hasn't had that injury before? I just, I think that that aspect of it is not entirely uh, fair. Seems silly. I don't think the injury should be included in the uh, punishment or should be a consideration because everybody's different. I think the fact that he hit him a knee on knee is automatically at least a phone call of don't do that again. That's not nice. And I think because this one was more or less more or less avoidable by Orlov is why he got he's sitting out two games. So that's my thought on that. So no Orlov, no Carlson against the Bruins. Game on Thursday is going to be interesting. NHL came out today and announced that they rescheduled a bunch of the games or all of the games, I believe, that they've had to uh postpone as a result of COVID related issues over the past feels like forever now in regards to the caps games you want to write these downs the Columbus game that was originally scheduled to be in DC that was scheduled for April 28th that will be now be played on February 8th so they're trying to get a lot of these games during the sort of all-star break or what was going to be I think the not the all-star break the Olympic break the game the Caps supposed to play in Montreal that was originally going to be on January 4th is now going to be on February 10th. The game where the Senators were coming to D.C. that was going to be on December 27th is now going to be on February 13th. The Caps are supposed to go and play in Nashville on April 2nd. That's now going to be on February 15th. And the game in Philly that was supposed to be on December 21st that's now going to be on February 17th. And lastly, the game against the Islanders that was originally scheduled for December 23rd. That's now going to be on April 28th. And the last little bit of Caps news before we get on to the other aspects of the show is that congratulations are in order for Joe Beninati, who has been voted the DC Sportscaster of the Year for the third time by the National Sports Media Association. So as I said, congratulations to Joe B. That's a very nice honor for him. Normally, this would be the part of the show where I, we'd have some music playing, but I don't have time for editing that tonight. So we're going to go ahead and go down on the farm. Let's start in Hershey, where the Bears had two games since last week, going 0-1-1, one, and one, not great, with a regulation loss to Wilkes-Barre Scranton and an overtime loss to Toronto. The Bears ended up dropping to second in the Atlantic Division with 41 points, but they're only one back of first place Springfield. They'll be back at it on Friday when they host Hartford at the Giants Center. They do that again on Saturday. The, I always kind of like the back-to-back game. I think that would be kind of cool in the NHL. I don't see it ever happening, but I feel like, it, especially against divisional rivals or teams that are closer, especially in the Metro, that could really develop a lot of intense games. Maybe that's not a good thing, actually. 
Bears also going to play off. Sorry, they actually get Monday off before they host Wilkes-Barre Scranton on Tuesday. Let's head down to South Carolina where the Stingrays not only won a game, but they won two. Two in a row. Both those wins were over Norfolk. With both of those wins, they have climbed out of the basement of the South Division. And with 27 points, they are up to fifth. Now, of course, that's out of seven teams. But hey, it's progress. They're going to attempt to continue their climb on Friday with back-to-back games in Jacksonville, that being Friday and Saturday, before welcoming the Icemen to the North Charleston Coliseum on Sunday. Now that we know what's going on down on the farm, let's go around the NHL and beyond. And when we go beyond, we're going to start in Boston, where the Bruins have retired Willie O'Ree's number 22. He became the 12th former Bruin to have the honor. O'Ree became the first black player to play in an NHL game 64 years ago on January 18th, 1958 against Montreal. I didn't actually know this, but he was declared legally blind in one eye, yet played in 44 games over two seasons in Boston before being traded to Montreal. That's awesome. O'Ree also had uh, recognition throughout the NHL. I know the Caps had decals on their helmets, which is pretty cool. A lot They're doing a lot of stuff for him up in Boston. It was fantastic to see. Montreal announced that they have hired former player Kent Hughes to be their new general... I'm sorry, did I say former player? Former player agent Kent Hughes to be their new general manager. The 51-year-old becomes the 18th general manager in franchise history. Montreal went from Stanley Cup finalists to one of the worst teams in the league. That is a hell of a drop. He's going to have some work cut out for him. Ross Johnston of the Islanders was suspended for three games for an illegal illegal check to the head of New Jersey's A.J. Greer. Are there legal checks to the head? Did you have to say it's illegal in the rules? Like, we know. Chicago's Calvin DeHaan was fined $2,500 for a dangerous trip against Montreal's Cole Caulfield. Can I ask, are there trips that aren't dangerous? I feel like the NHL needs to look at how they list some of these uh, no-nos because duh a trip implies that causing someone to fall when they didn't know they were going to fall therefore it's always dangerous or I don't know seems dangerous to me now not to be outdone Montreal's Jonathan Druin was fined 5k for cross-checking Dallas's Tyler Sagan another guy's given up $5,000 LA's Philippe Denault he got fined for a dangerous trip there it is again against Tampa's Braden Point Let's shift gears to beyond the NHL as the Premier Hockey Federation, in hopes of capitalizing on the excitement over the upcoming Winter Olympics and women's hockey, is more than doubling each team's salary cap to $750,000, as well as adding two expansion franchises next season. Salary cap ceiling right now in the NHL is, what, like $81 million? And the women's league is only $750,000. That's a problem. Currently, the Premier Hockey Federation... I like that name. That's actually pretty cool. They have six teams in the Buffalo Buttes, the Boston Pride, which is a pretty solid logo, by the way. The Metropolitan Riveters, Toronto Six, their logo needs some work. The Connecticut Whale and the Minnesota Whitecaps. Now, one of the new expansion teams will be based in Montreal, while the other team is going to be based somewhere in the U.S., although that information has not been released. Why is that the case, I wonder? Agreement hasn't been announced. Working on stadium deals. It's weird that they wouldn't say where that team is going to be. Ooh, could it be in D.C.? I didn't mean for that to rhyme. That would be pretty cool. And I'd I'd say I want to go to a game, but COVID, so maybe not. I also feel like it's probably not in D.C. because I feel like the news would have come out where, because they're terrible about keeping secrets in this town. I mean, the Washington football team is completely botched how they're doing their team name announcement thing or they're doing it on purpose which they've still botched it because it's terrible but whatever I wish that would be cool to have it in DC or Baltimore if they're not going to ECHL team uh, a, a PHF team would be pretty cool and I have to imagine they'll have a better name and a better logo than the one that's rumored right now for the Washington football team because that's not going well at all and that's what we're going to wrap up the show. That's it. That's the show. Thank you for listening. Thank you for streaming, downloading, and most of all, thank you in advance for telling others about the show. See what I did there? 
Now, if you want to continue the conversation, hit me up on Twitter at WTP Coach Dan, where you can find me talking all kinds of Capitals related stuff when I actually have time to sit on my phone on Twitter and actually have interesting things to say, which lately has been less and less. I'll be honest. I'm also on there occasionally talking about Arsenal Football Club, Buffalo Bills, big game this week come up weekend. I can't speak. This is what happens when I'm the only one talking for 40 minutes. It's just me babbling and I run out of words or understanding how to say words. Bill's got a big game this weekend against the Chiefs. The Washington Commanders. I feel like that's the first time I've said it out loud and I don't like it. And I really hope the rumors are wrong. Because I, uh, if, you, if you've watched the video of them like announcing that they're going to make the announcement, which, sure... So some people think they did it on purpose. I'm not giving them that credit, but you can see some of the logos, especially with the helmet, on like reflecting on the glass. When I think Jason Wright is pulling it up to show Ron Rivera, I, I hope they did it on purpose. But I would not be shocked if it was an accident. Uh, and I still, I still hope it's wrong. I know they say it's not going to be Red Wolves. I still want that to be the case. Make it happen. Commanders is stupid. I don't like it. I could get used to it if I have to. I still think it's stupid. I'm also on there talking about other sports on Twitter. That being, if you've forgotten what the heck I'm talking about, because I almost did. I'm on there talking about other sports and teams when I have the chance to do so. You can also find my regular co-host, Brandon, on Twitter, at Brando Cash. And I always like to give a shout-out to Brandon's other podcast about the Baltimore Ravens called The Call. So if you happen to be a fan of the playoff less Ravens, sorry, Brandon, go ahead and check out The Call on all of your podcasting apps. Now, if you've enjoyed the show, and I hope you have, check us out on Facebook, on our Facebook page, obviously, at facebook.com slash whatthepuckpod. It's where we post when new shows are coming out, as well as other information related to the Washington Capitals, the Hershey Bears, the South Carolina Stingrays, and other hockey-related news and fun things that pop into Brandon's head. So, as I said, that's it. That's the end of the show. Thank you for joining me. Hopefully, it wasn't painful for you. Brandon and I will be back next week. Let's see. Actually, before we go, let's talk about the Caps schedule coming up. We've got Boston in Boston on Thursday, the 20th. That game's at 7 p.m. That is on ESPN Plus, Hulu, and whatever TV AS is. I have no idea. I should probably know that. Then they welcome Ottawa to Capital One Arena. That game will be on NBC Sports Washington. That's at 7 o'clock on Saturday. Vegas comes to town at 7 o'clock on Monday. That game is on the NHL Network. NBC Sports Washington and a couple other networks that I don't recognize what those things are. And then I don't know if Brandon and I are talking next Tuesday or next Thursday, so I'll give you Wednesday's game. Wednesday, 7 o'clock, that being the 26th, that is a, they're welcoming the Sharks to Capital One Arena. That's on NBC Sports Washington. So like I said, that's it. That's the show. I hope you've enjoyed it. Go ahead and check out the next. we got four, three or four games till we talk again. Hopefully it goes well and Caps get back on top of the division. They're only some odd amount of points they're uh, what, what I said earlier one point out of the division even though they do have a few more games played than others so hopefully things go well let's go Caps talk to you next week this has been a production of Brando Cash Entertainment music by DJ Wolfman voiceover by Sarah Jacks for more information go to BrandoCash.com